found in water thanks to things like atmospheric deposition, as well as combustion of fossil fuels. And when a fish gets exposed to something like this, it can lead to brain lesions as well as emac emaciation. And when people are exposed, they can experience neurological and behavioral disorders. Uh, it can also threaten the development of a child in the womb, uh, which is why there tends to be a large warning to those individuals who are pregnant when it comes to mercury consumption. And so, so far at ORCA, we've tested over 800 fish for mercury. Uh, only a few of them have no concentrations of mercury, but it is important to keep in mind that individuals have varying ranges of mercury. And so out of all of the individuals we've tested, out of all of the 832 fish we've tested, on average, there is a mercury concentration of 0 0.189 milligrams per kilogram. Oops. And so last year at this time, we had another findings to date where we shared this graph in particular. So this graph is looking at mercury by county. So you can see that the mercury concentrations are on our y-axis and that's in milligrams per kilogram. And so you can see the varying sample sizes throughout all of the counties, as well as the fact that Martin County appears to have higher concentrations of mercury compared to the other three. And if we look at this graph, you can still see those 2022 concentrations. They're the orange bars, but we also have all of the data since then. So an additional year of data marking that 2023 in blue bar graph. And so you can see overall, all of the counties experienced an increase in mercury. Again, our mercury concentrations are on the y-axis in milligrams per kilogram. Uh, and again, Martin County has a higher concentration, a statistically significant higher concentration of mercury when compared to the other three counties. But again, it's important to keep in mind the varying sample sizes. So while now Brevard, Indian River, and St. Lucie County have over 100 fish, Martin County has only increased by two fish in the past year. And so in order to be confident with the data analysis that we're running, we're really hoping to get that number over 105 fish. So please, if you live in those areas, donate some fish to this project. Uh, but to put this kind of into perspective, what we're seeing, this orange bar across the graph represents our EPA, FDEP consumption guideline for pregnant women and children. And this concentration is 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. And that gray bar at the top is our EPA, FDA consumption guideline for the general population. So overall, you can see that the average individual fish caught within each county, the average mercury concentrations are below the guideline for the general population. However, for all of the counties, those average mercury concentrations do appear to be above the guideline for pregnant women and children. Again, keep in mind that each individual varies within the amount of mercury that they contain. And you can kind of see that within this graph here. So within this graph, what we have are our top consumed fish. So we know this from information that we've collected in our surveys. We know that people locally are consuming these fish listed below. And this time we're looking at mercury concentrations per serving. So information we've gathered from our surveys as well has told us the average amount that people are consuming when they catch and eat fish. And so in this case, we're using an average serving size of eight ounces. So this is the average mercury concentration per that eight ounce serving size. And again, the orange bar represents the guideline for pregnant women and children, while the gray bar represents the guideline for the general population. And you can see that the blue fish and the spotted sea trout both have concentrations on average that exceed that general population guideline, whereas seven of the other fish listed are below that general population guideline, but above the guideline for pregnant women and children, where the nine black drums that we've tested individually on average show concentrations that fall below that consumption guideline for pregnant women and children. 
And so the more fish that we get, especially of these species, because as you can see, the varying size differs between these types of fish, uh, the more robust and the more telling that this data will be. And so now I wanna go ahead and move on to glyphosate. Uh, last findings to date, we talked about, we talked a little bit about glyphosate and a lot of our preliminary results from testing about 50 fish. And so thanks to the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program, they provided us money to test 100 fish for glyphosate. And so now we have that complete data set available. And so for those of you who are not familiar with glyphosate, glyphosate is an herbicide. It's the most active ingredient in Roundup. Uh, the EPA has heavily talked about this topic and it's currently listed as probably not carcinogenic to humans, but more studies really need to be done to better understand how this herbicide could affect us as well as our environment. But studies have shown that glyphosate can really persist in the environment uh, within our own pollution mapping project. We've seen glyphosate concentrations within the water column and pore water. And one study in particular actually suggests that it can persist in the environment for about 30, 47 to 315 days uh, in the water based on certain conditions. And now when a fish is exposed to glyphosate, uh, they tend to have some, sorry, they, they tend to have some hindering to their growth. Uh, it tends to affect them in their juvenile stage as they get lar larger. And so the way we test this, we tested over 116 fish, is we use an ELISA. And so from this, in this graph, or excuse me, from this slide, you can see that out of all of the fish we've tested, the average was about 0 0.372 parts per billion. And all of the fish we tested had glyphosate present. Uh, again, there is a range, so each individual has differing glyphosate concentrations. And while the EPA has recommendations for glyphosate in drinking water, they don't actually have any recommendations regarding other glyphosate exposure like consumption, which is what we're testing for here by testing fish fillets for the presence of glyphosate. And so these are all 116 fish that we've tested. You can see that the concentrations range from close to 0 0.8 glyphosate, or excuse me, 0 0.8 parts per billion to just above 0 0.1 parts per billion. And when we chose these fish, we randomly selected fish from the list that we've been given from our surveys of fish being consumed by individuals. So all of these fish are being consumed by fishers going out and collecting them. Uh, they include fish from the estuary as well as from some freshwater environments. In this graph, what we're looking at is the average glyphosate based on fish length. So at the bottom, you can see the different groups of fish lengths all in millimeters. So part of our process that our citizen scientists do when they're processing a fish is they'll collect the length of that fish. Uh, and then on our y-axis, we have our glyphosate concentration in parts per billion. So with this preliminary data, we, can, we don't really see any pattern, uh, which is important because at this point in time, it's kind of hinting that there is no accumulation based on age of glyphosate. So in this case, our measurement of age is in length. But it's also important to keep in mind that within this project, we're only getting legal and seasoned fish. So they're often the same length. We're really not getting any sub-adult or juvenile fish. Um, but from this data, currently we don't see any patterns. And so the next thing I wanna talk about is microcystins. So it's been a while since we've talked about this and we've tested over 600 fish for this. Uh, microcystin is a biotoxin that is commonly produced by cyanobacteria uh, or commonly referred to as blue-green algae. It is important to keep in mind that not all cyanobacteria produce microcystin, 
Uh, but microcystin is something that we experienced here in the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, as an example, in 2016, we had that really large bloom of cyanobacteria that produced this biotoxin. And so out of all of the fish we've tested, on average, we're seeing a concentration of 0.418 parts per billion. And only about 43% of our fish samples showed concentrations of microcystin. Again, each individual is showing varying concentrations of microcystin. Some have none present, others have concentrations as high as 3.16. And the EPA does, again, currently have limits for drinking water, uh, but they don't have any guidelines regarding other methods of exposure, including consumption. Uh, the World Health Organization, on the other hand, does have a tolerable daily intake recommendation of 0 0.04 parts per billion of body weight uh, for contaminated seafood with microcystin. So this is our average microcystin concentrations per year. So you can see we have 2020, 2021, and 2022. And you can see there's this gradual decrease of microcystin concentration per year. Uh, it is important to keep in mind that the this does include all species, all locations throughout the Indian River Lagoon. But this could hint at these fish naturally removing the microcystin from their systems which studies have shown that they've been able to do. Uh, so 2019 is not included in this graph because the project started at the end of 2019 and 2020 and 2021 have a full set, full year data from January to December. Um, as you'll see in our next graph, 2022 is about January to October, I wanna say, because we're still currently running the rest of those samples. But you can see a pretty, drastic decrease in 2022. So as we continue to further explore this microcystin data, since we have three years worth, we know that people live here year round as given by our survey data, uh, which means that people are exposed to these potential biotoxins year round when they are fishing and finding food for themselves as well as their family. And because these blooms are known to be occur based on the time of year. They tend to occur during warmer months. Uh, we really want to start looking at this data in a seasonal manner. So I'll walk you through this graph so you can see that this is our microcystin data broken data broken down by year. So on the top we have individuals with their microcystin concentration in 2019. So each dot represents an individual. And the darker the dots, that means there's more individuals that shared that concentration. This is also the dates represent when the fish was caught, not when the fish was processed. So these fish were caught in November or December um, of a year. And again, the darker the dot, the more individuals that were at that concentration. So we have 2019, 2020, and 2021, and 2022. So you can see there's kind of a cluster that occurs around July of 2020, and it tends to continue into all the way to the winter of 2021. But it's also at this time where we start to see individuals that have lower concentrations of microcystin occurring now going back to that zero-ish range. Uh, and then in 2022, we're really seeing low if any microcystin present in individuals. So we really want to start, this is kind of just our first attempt at looking at this data in a seasonal manner, but you can start to see some patterns of when these blue, when the, these exposures of the fish to this toxin may be occurring. So now I want to spend some time talking about our microplastics. So our microplastics is a pretty long process. It takes some time for us to be able to get this data back. Um, and right now, and this graph is looking at microplastics 
in fish stomachs. And so you can see that we've tested 488 fish for microplastics in their stomachs. And microplastics are important because they're broken down pieces of plastics from things like tarps or synthetic textiles or water bottles or whatever other plastic material you can think of, things that are broken down to a really small size. And these microplastics have the ability to bind to different chemicals as well as toxins. So when we initially started this project, we were initially looking at them in fish stomachs to kind of get an idea as to whether or not they were present in the Indian River Lagoon. And now seeing microplastics in fish stomachs is important because these fish are now getting a false nutrition. They're, they're consuming something that is making them think they're hungry, but it's not providing or making them think they're full, but it's providing no nutritional value, as well as potentially exposing them to other chemicals or toxins. And so 278 out of 488 fish had microplastics present, so more than just over more than half. But each individual had different amounts of microplastics within them. Some had no microplastics, and one individual had as many as 21 pieces within their stomach. And these microplastics come in various colors and shapes that we try and denote as we identify them. So in fish stomachs, we're predominantly seeing blue, black, and transparent microplastics. So the y-axis over here is showing us the number of pieces that are that color. And so predominantly blue, black, and transparent, but we are seeing quite a range of different colors. And we're also looking at the shape that this microplastic is in. Uh, you can see that we're, it's predominantly fibers at this point in time, followed by fragments. But we know from our surveys that people aren't necessarily consuming the stomach, they're really consuming the filet. And so we thought that it was really important for us to start examining if there's microplastics in the filet to be able to understand that human health risk that may be occurring. And so we've tested 39 fish at this point. Again, it's a timely analysis, uh, but about 77% of those samples have microplastics present. Again, there's quite a range per individual, but they're still there and people are being exposed to them. So as we continue to grow this project, we're really interested in Focusing on target species, so those species that we know people are consuming, like the sheep's head, the black drums, uh, but also we want to include freshwater species like the speckled perch, which we know people are consuming. We're also looking to get more fish from Martin County, as you could see in those county graphs. Uh, we have quite a ways to go before we can get to a number that provides some statistical confidence with what we're seeing. We hope to continue to get uh, more surveys back. We currently have about 141 surveys, uh, but the more we can understand about what people are consuming throughout the Indian River Lagoon, uh, the more informative we can be with where this project is going. And we also are looking forward to adding future analyses, including pharmaceuticals and saxitoxin and controlled substances. Uh, the more funding we have, the more we can start to look at all of these different analyses, as well as look at more fish. Uh, as always, please keep a lookout for upcoming events. Uh, these include survey workshops. So we have our citizen scientists go out and help us collect surveys from our local fishers. Uh, we also have our processing, homogenizing, and extraction events. Uh, without our citizen scientists, we would not be able to have all of this data because all of those steps need to be done in order for us to run any sort of analysis. We also have a Costa giveaway fishing tournament. So where each fish donated to our project will have you uh, enter one raffle ticket. Uh, but certain species equal more raffle entries or more raffle tickets. So species like snook and flounder will allow you to have five entries to win a pair of costas. Um, we're always looking for help with our microplastic analysis. 
because it's a timely test. Uh, we're looking for people that can hopefully help on a weekly basis, but if you can't commit that much time, that's totally okay. I'm happy to work with your schedule. Um, just feel free to email me. And then tomorrow we actually have an open house. So feel free to come by our Center for Citizen Science here in Vero. Get to know all of us. If you have any questions that maybe aren't answered through this presentation, or if you think of more questions later in the night, that's a great opportunity to come by and talk it out with us. Uh, I want to give a big thanks to all of our bait shops who act as donation locations. Uh, people can drop off their fish there and they'll wait for us to come pick them up. Uh, we've also been talking to some of them about hosting their own pop-up processing events. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And then, of course, thank you to our sponsors who, without them, uh, we couldn't do the work that we do. So thank you to all of them. Uh, some references. And then that is our findings to date. Uh, I do realize this fish is not in the Indian River Lagoon. That's it's a sunfish. Uh, yeah, it's my personal favorite. So that's why I've included it here. It feels very fitting for a fish monitoring update. Uh, but at this time, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them to the best of my ability. Bridget, can you hear me? It's Marilyn. Yes, I can. Okay, I want to ask you a question about the microcystin and the biotoxins. Yep. Is that that's something that's found naturally in nature, right? So the blooms do occur naturally. Um, historically, there's been blooms. They're predominantly a freshwater species, so they don't often occur in the ocean. However, a lot of studies have shown that the microcystin aeruginosa species, which is what we most commonly see, has somewhat of a salt tolerance, which is why in the past we've been able to see the estuary, which is also a mix of freshwater and saltwater. Uh, but that's why we've been able to kind of see it extend out into the Indian River Lagoon. So if this is naturally found in nature, and that's what I'm getting at, and we see the decrease in the amount of the fish, is that because maybe genetically or some historically thing with them is that they're learning how to get rid of it in their system? Absolutely. So studies have shown that just like we have the ability to remove toxins from our body, fish do as well. It is important to keep in mind, I, I didn't say this previously, and I'm sorry for that. So that biotoxin in particular is a hepatotoxin, meaning it attacks the liver mainly. And yeah. so because of that, it's going to, you're going to see higher concentrations of it predominantly in the liver and the liver has the ability to flush that out. Um, those samples, those individuals were fish fillets, uh, but it could be that those fish are removing that microcystin over time. Super duper. Are there any other questions, comments? All right. Well, all right. Well, I guess I will go ahead and end this Zoom call. Oh, well, uh, hi, Bridget. Oh, it's hi. Sharon. Hi. Hi. Um, I had a question. Absolutely. The parts per billion for water for the glyphosate yep. and the, and the, um, you said that we knew how much the limit was in water. Yes. So we well, know that the limit that the EPA has for drinking water is 0 0.7 milligrams per, per liter or 700 parts per billion. So those fish fall far below those concentrations. Well, have you tested the water in the lagoon? So we do test the water in the lagoon as a part of our pollution mapping project. So next month, uh, we're actually gonna be having our findings to date for that project, where the project coordinator, Veronica, will be sharing some of that data that they've seen. And, and do so you think Oops, sorry. That it's over, that it's over the limit in water? Um, 
So I haven't looked at the data particularly for pollution mapping. So I couldn't answer that question for you. Um, what I will say is that they're looking at it both in water as well as in for water. And from the literature that I've read, glyphosate has a tendency to bind more towards sediment. Uh, as I mentioned, it does have a persistence in the water column, but it tends to bind to sediment. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Bridget, you. can you hear me? This is Artie Schneider. I had a question. I can hear you, Artie. Oh, good. Um, let's see. The uh, microcystins, you talked about them being in the stomach and then you examined them in the filet. And I would just, I, I'm sorry, I just didn't catch what the difference was. So are you talking about microcystin or microplastics? Because we test microplastics in the stomach and in the filet, but we test microcystin. We tested it in the liver and the, and the filet. Um, the first, I think it was. Microplastics? Yeah. Okay. So the there's not too much of a difference. So one of the concerns about microplastics in the stomachs of fish is that it can often act as like a false feed or a false nutrition, meaning that the fish is consuming something that's taking up room in its stomach, but isn't providing any nutritional value. So it could inhibit them from eating food in the future or how much food they're consuming. Uh, Microplastics in the filet is really more of a human health concern because that's the part of the fish that we're consuming. It's not necessarily a hindrance to their mobility or um, to their health, as far as I'm aware at this moment. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, I have a question, Bridget. Okay. Uh, this is Ed Killer from TC Palm. And um, unfortunately, I missed about the first five minutes of the presentation. So if there's a way I could rewatch it, I'd, I'd like mm -hmm. to do that. But it's recorded. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'd like to, I'd like to find it and be able to watch it again. Um, this, this, the question I had though is um, did you, did you, did you keep track of like where the fish that, where you tested uh, microcystin, for instance, did you keep a track of where, did you keep track of where those fish were, were brought in from or where they were caught? Yes. So, so one of the requirements that we have for any fish that are being donated to this project, on top of them being legal, on top of them being in season and whole and frozen, is that we like to know who donated them in case we have any questions and a general area of where they were caught. So what we've done is we've actually divided the Indian River Lagoon into different sectors, and that can be found on our website. And we ask that the fisher provides us with at least just that sector number, if not a general description of where it was caught. Okay, so you got so you got sector number. How much? How many sectors have you divided? Like, I'm assuming the St. Lucie River is part of the Indian River Lagoon, uh, as the way you view it, right? Yes. So yeah. I believe part of the St. Lucie estuary is uh, mapped out in the sector maps. Each county has their own number of sectors. So, okay. for example, I believe Brevard County has about 25 sectors, whereas like St. Lucie County has maybe 19 to 20. Don't quote me on those numbers. Yeah. But uh, they're different depending on the county. The reason I ask that is because you know, the one thing I've learned about microcystin after um, covering it for the newspaper for many years is that, you know, it, it tends to bloom at a certain time of year. Mm -hmm. So you've got a time, you've got another curve for your data of when the microcystin is present mm -hmm. and what waterways it's present in. So mm -hmm. for instance, you know, I noticed the research didn't start till late 2019 mm -hmm. But the last time we had a major out, you know, microcystin bloom that came all the way into the St. Lucie River was probably 2018. Yeah. So it's probably, yeah, it's probably going to, you know, unfortunately, I'd hate to say it, but I mean, you need to have a bad algae bloom to figure out, you know, what's what species are being affected. But but the, you know, the the, the one thing, one suggestion I might make, and this is I know it's all funding restricted by funding, but, you know, uh, I'm wondering how much those species that live in Lake Okeechobee are are being affected by the microcystin. 
Absolutely. And, and that's yeah. one of the reasons we're really pushing for freshwater fish. Um, yeah. I know looking at the DEP weekly reports, uh, you know, there's blooms occurring in Lake Okeechobee quite often. Uh, I know there was a bloom in, in 2020 that occurred over there. Um, and so being able to get more freshwater fish, especially because that biotoxin in particular is a freshwater toxin. Uh, right. It's not really found in, I don't want to say it's not found in saltwater environments because again, it has a growing salt tolerance, but it's predominantly found in these freshwater environments. So well, being able yeah, well, to understand, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say being able to understand what they're being exposed to, um, it could be different than what we're seeing in estuary fish. One thing I noticed too is, and it's my final question. I'm sorry for no, that's all okay. The time. No, I'll talk to you all offline more about this. <laughs> but the um, I, I mean, I, um, you know, and I, and I came in after about five minutes, so I don't know if you had anything about snook, but it looked like some of the data you showed there weren't any snook listed in in the data. So, so I'm just. Snook have been very hard to get since it's all donation based. Um, I actually just our 1000th fish that I processed today was actually a snook. So we've got about three. Um, we just recently sent out uh, mercury results. So I think we just got those back and they are they did not make it into this presentation in time. Uh, but we've only got three snook in our database anyways. Do, so, do they have to do they have to donate the whole fish? So <laughs> that's a really great question because we know that those fish are not fish that people want to give up. Um, I think one of the hardest things that we because we've gone back and forth about this, I think one of the hardest things that we have faced is that we want to make sure that they're all facing a similar standard operating procedure. So they're all being treated the same way. Um, that being said, I have told a number of fishers that I am happy to make a compromise with them. Um, we will take, especially because the legal limit snook, they're still pretty a good size snook. You know, we'll take the, the carcass of the fish. And if you could leave us with one filet or half a filet, I mean, that's enough to be able to run the data that we, a, a complete data set on a fish. Yeah, that you get have. the mercury content out of them and you could get exactly. the, uh, yeah, we you get, get mercury, you a lot of stuff. glyphosate, yeah. microplastics. Yeah. Uh, we can get data on PFAS. It's nice for us to have a reserve just in case, um, as you saw, there's that list of additional analyses we'd like to have. So it's nice to be able to have a reserve for when the opportunity and when the funding comes for us to be able to start looking at these, that we can throw those fish in as well, especially for a highly prized fish like a snook. It'd be yeah. super valuable to be able to have some in reserve. Yeah, the, yeah, legal snook's probably about, it's probably about six 20, or six years old or. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's 28 to 32 inches. Yep. So it's probably, I, I got to look at the snook data the FWC has to figure out what age that is, but. But yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Hey, I'm sorry you're hogging the time here. I'll, no, I'll, 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 it's been that's fascinating. What I'm here for. <laughs> it's a very good presentation. I, and I, I want to talk to you guys more about it offline. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? Something I can clarify? All right. Well, I guess with that, um, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, feel free to email me. My email is on this slide right here. If you have any questions or again, need some clarification. Uh, my name's Bridget. Um, thank you guys so much for the time uh, that you joined us. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.